morning, Sharice. How's it going? Good morning, Eugene. It's good. Things uh, are all right. Happy Friday. As I understand, you were sick the last few days. You feeling better? I am feeling a lot better. Thank you for asking. Yeah. How are you? You're getting on a flight today? Yeah, I'm flying to uh, Vancouver in a few hours here. Mm. So before we get going, I should probably let people know that this is unfortunately our second time recording this because we had a little bit of audio drift um, in the first recording. And for those who aren't familiar with that, I honestly didn't really know either. I just experienced it where you would sync up the files and post the audio files. And while they might start in tandem at the beginning, over the course of, you know, playing it back, you know, it was actually really quick. Within like 10 or 15 seconds, they would slowly fall out of sync. So it just became a big headache. Um, I would say with every podcast, we're getting a little bit better, a little bit more refined. I think one of the big things in the first few ones was it was probably too off the cuff. And now we're actually going through the process of outlining our thoughts making sure we're actually explaining what we're talking about. But I guess that's kind of the beauty of things as we as we progress and move along. Yeah, it feels good. I think um, we're getting some rhythm on this. Yeah. And if this is your first time listening to Making It Up, uh, we basically take topics and interesting pieces of news that take place over the course of the week and kind of look at it from a deeper perspective and try to analyze what is what are they actually trying to say? What does it actually mean? And as an added bonus, you're going to be able to check out Sharice and I's illustrations based on these topics. And obviously, some are better than others. Mine are usually terrible, uh, pretty comedic. Off, but uh, other than that, yeah, let's get into it. Um, so this week's episode outlines four topics. Yep. Rel- relatively heavy topics. Do you want to maybe um, give an overview of the four topics we're talking about? Sure. So today we are going to talk about everything, the video game that could potentially win an Oscar, the future of commenting and whether it's going to be heavily dependent on AI, the role of brands as sponsors of the creative arts and whether that's the right way to go about it, and this new company called Tonal, which is aiming to create more diversity in stock photography. Cool. Should we start off with everything? Yep. If you aren't familiar with this piece of news, um, the trailer for everything, this video game, won um, an award at the Vienna Shorts Festival. So that makes it eligible for the 90th Academy Awards in 2018. Uh, the game was developed by David O'Reilly, who took three years to develop it. And the premise of the game is you can assume the role of over 10,000 different characters. And it works as what they call a persistent universe, where everything is sort of controlled by you, the user. Mm-hmm. And you can design your own worlds. Now, do you want to start off maybe with your perspective on what it means for this to be potentially up for nomination for an Academy Award? Sure. And what the actual reality of, you know, this world between video games and movies actually means. So one thing I think is interesting is, like you mentioned, what actually won is not the gameplay itself. Like, It's not the agency of being a frog or a bug or a microbe that won an award. It's the trailer. Okay. So it's interesting that they've sort of separated um, the game trailer as this abstract short film that is eligible for an award, but it was made through playing. So I guess you could say the Academy or... Um, the juries that are in charge of these film festivals are becoming more willing to consider media that was created in alternate ways. And one thing that is interesting about their uh, accepting of a video game is sort of an acknowledgement of how much entertainment video games are now providing, that they're sort of edging into this film category. Yeah, I did a little bit of research beforehand uh, just to get some figures and Video games were apparently a $91 billion industry in 2016, Mm -hmm. which, which eclipses global box office revenues, which were 38.6 billion. Oh, that's interesting. Um, but on top of that, there actually were some worrying stats because China had a big slowdown and China obviously is the massive market everyone is looking towards when it comes to growth. But if that's happening, then it sort of brings into question what is, uh, what is the long-term viability of movies? Obviously, it's so big that it's not going to disappear overnight, but it just 
it just makes you wonder if you have, you know, two hours of spare time, how are you going to spend those two hours? Are you going to go to the movie theater or are you going to play a game like everything in the comfort of your own home? Well, you know, it's interesting that you bring up China because you know how they, the relationship between China and Hollywood works. I, I know, but maybe you can elaborate on people that yeah. are less familiar. So China only allows, I think, 32 or 36 Hollywood movies into China every year. So Hollywood actually winds up kind of trying to make every movie a potential like China bought movie because if China buys it, like suddenly the box office is going to shoot through the roof, right? In the subway stations, there's a lot. There's an abundance of advertising for video games, like yeah. uh, mobile multiplayer games, all that stuff. Oh yeah. So it's 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 crazy because you know a few years ago you wouldn't necessarily expect to have massive billboards in the subways. Uh, trying to sell you on, on a video game, you know, especially I think in, in Hong Kong, from my experience, like I've never seen a major console. I've never seen a major console game shown, but I see a lot of these. That's so true. Fantasy, yeah. These fantasy characters, um, anime type sort of, uh, video games where people are just running around in these massive worlds. So, you know, it, it, to that point, it's probably a nice segue to, sort of dissect the difference between a video game and a movie and the actual creative intent behind it. Because, you know, with a movie, someone has created a narrative that you're all along for the ride. Yeah. And when you're playing a video game, it's you're creating the narrative within bumpers because you can't, you can't always go off the rails and just like create anything and everything. You're trying to kind of bumble your way along a, a predetermined path. So I think that's kind of interesting and because you're kind of, you realize that while you, in a video game, you're kind of creating your own narrative. It's not entirely as, as it's not entirely within your control to the same extent as you think it is. I'm a bit curious. Um, let's make this a little bit personal. What sort of video games do you play and why are you attracted to those games? I pretty much only play one game and that's, FIFA, like EA Sports is FIFA. And the reason is, is because I, I like playing video games as a social element where I can play against somebody. Um, and there's, it's just, you know, a byproduct of what my favorite sport is, my favorite activity. But would you, you know, on that, would you play online with strangers or when you say yeah. social? Okay. And I have, but I would say under those instances, I, I'm playing only because there's no one else to play against. And I'd rather play against a human being than a computer. But I also see like, you know, I will, there's that game Uncharted. Yeah. And it's crazy the way people approach it because, you know, one person can play and then two or three people can sit around watching him play and they're okay with that. Yeah. Like, but that makes it like a movie, weirdly, because we're talking correct. about how video games are not like movies and or like yeah. what the differences are. And the fact that games like Uncharted are so entertaining, people will just watch someone else play, makes it yeah. more like regular traditional media. I can't think of any point in time when I was younger where that would fly. Like it was always my brother and I fighting over who was going to play next. Right. You know, and this is like a thing where people are more than happy to just watch. Well, and I, yeah, like that. I fall into that category. Because I yeah. watch, so I've watched Uncharted played. I've watched Last of Us played, which is, these are both titles by Naughty Dog, which are, you know, well recognized to be as good as blockbuster films, right? For their entertainment value. Uh, did you want to add to your point? Does it even matter if, if video games are ever recognized by major institutions like the Academy Awards? I mean, okay. So to go back to this item of news, was it strange to you that it qualified? Like, what was the point of interest here? Was that it was a video game, right? And not like the trailer itself. I honestly, the Academy Awards as an institution has zero interest to me. Um, and on that basis, I just think that it's, it's a, it's the openness that they're trying to promote is a sense of, of need. They need to be relevant mm -hmm. and going where media is and, and trying to find a way to like latch on to something that generally falls within a similar premise, you know, like a trailer, which is kind of cinematic. Yeah. 
I mean, it's not, it's not really their detriment, but you know, if they didn't feel threatened, I don't think they would have cared about letting in other mediums. They would have just kept it in the same traditional format. Yeah. I, I agree. I mean, I think, you know, for listeners, if you go watch the trailer, it's, it's worth watching, but it's not really stunning. Okay. It's not exactly like short film award winning material. So the fact that it's up for an award really does feel like the film industry grabbing for straws. And I honestly, I started watching it and I was like, what is this? This is bullshit. And I turned it off. <laughs> um, I think yeah. the game has merits. I, I actually would, I would play the game. <laughs> I think the game is yeah. in- intriguing to me and the kind of games I play, which tend to be actually the opposite of what you play, non-social and non-competitive. Yeah. Let's, let's maybe move on to the next topic. Sure thing. Is the future of commenting in the hands of AI? Um, the New York Times launched a new AI powered program called Moderator. Okay. And the reason this is even necessary for the New York Times is because they get upwards of 12,000 comments submitted per day. The program, Moderator, was created alongside Jigsaw, a tech incubator, which is part of Google's parent company, Alphabet. An additional partner in this project is Instrument, who we are happy to have called partners. Um, they built the prototype for Macon back in the day. So the interesting thing about Moderator is that it is grabbing data from 16 million mo- hand-moderated comments dating back to 2007. And that's how it has the power to attempt to predict what the New York Times would approve and disapprove. How does that make you feel about reading? Do you ever read the New York Times comments section? I do, but sometimes it's just overwhelming because, you know, it, it's overwhelm, it's an overwhelming feeling when you get to a story and there are already like 800 comments and mm. you're usually just looking at the last one or the, no, no, sorry, not the last one, the top one. It's kind of like Reddit. Knowing, knowing that moderator is going to be in charge now, would that make it a better experience no, for you? No, I don't, I don't think it would be, um, I think should, I think it's going to be very seamless. Because that's kind of the role it's trying to achieve is just being seamless. I think it's a great use of AI and machine learning where you're going in and pulling massive amounts of data to, to, con- to continually refine it to get to a point where, you know, it's all operating behind the scenes. And, you know, the way, the way I see this is if the ultimate goal is to improve dialogue and discussion online and you know that, Hey, you know what? I'm going to, I'm going to go into the comments section and expect high quality comments. Um, I don't know why it would be detrimental in any case. Mm-hmm. You know, I, I just think that there is one part of me that, that wishes to think that, Hey, you know what? The internet should be very democratic and open, but I don't think the purpose of this is to reduce that. Yeah. It's to just remove the, the, the fluff and the people that are probably coming in to deliberately post inflammatory comments and to troll people. And, you know, you're kind of like, if, if the spectrum is out of a hundred, right? You're basically removing the, the endpoints, the extremities and shrinking it. So hopefully, you know, let's say from 0.15 to 0.85, everything within is hopefully of a, of a better quality in terms of commenting. When you say quality, what are you looking for? When I look for quality of comment, I want something that's well constructed and not super ignorant on the basis that they're unwilling to see other people's perspectives. And it's kind of a very aggressive tone because, you know, the, the way people communicate online without face to face interaction obviously is very different. You know, people approach things, um, and say things they wouldn't say, obviously, if I was speaking to you right now. That to me is one of the key points is, you know, transparency and transparent. I mean, this opens up a whole nother can of worms too, because when it comes to transparency, it's some things you should be able to say with anonymity because, you know, maybe it's sensitive information. Maybe it's this that, you know, you don't want to divulge who you are, but there's still credibility. So, I mean, that's probably a little bit off topic, but I really believe that having these conversations as you would in real life would probably go a long ways towards improving what's being said and how it's being said. Do you think there's any chance that with the AI in charge, because tech is created by humans, right? So the AI is not this totally fair, unbiased piece of software. It's based off of 
stupid decisions, but it could um, cause things to spiral in a way that maybe humans didn't intend. So what if this moderator, um, oh, it's called moderator, right? This AI moderator winds up being somehow politically slanted or, you know, filters out things that are all of a certain, like, segment of the population would say that, would think that. That's something definitely worth considering. And as much as someone like the Times is trying to be very bipartisan, very down the middle, just by virtue of where they're located, they're going to take on the characteristics and traits of being in Manhattan, you know, and there's no way to get around that as much as you think that, hey, you know what, I'm going to be very down the middle, very objective. It's not going to work that way because both its location and its readership are going to define how it approaches, you know, the algorithm Mm -hmm. behind this, this moderation, this commenting. So there's no problem. There's no problem that the AI might be unfair because the New York Times doing it themselves anyway was already slanted that way. I mean, I'm not saying that this is necessarily what happens, and I think what happens, I think it is interesting to think that it's okay for the AI to be biased, possibly biased, because the people who created it, we know that they are biased in that way anyway. And is that permissible to you? That this thing echoes their beliefs? I don't see the inclusion of this tool as anything particularly different than what already represents the New York Times. It's already their perspective and point of view because it's drawing on historical data. And the historical data is, you know, the moderation of all those comments is part of the New York Times' strategy and what they deem to be acceptable. So I don't really think it it comes in and changes anything. It just makes it a little bit easier and one thing that we've traditionally not had in, in commenting has always been the kind of the wild, wild west. You know, moderation has been incredibly difficult. You know, you go on any major website and you see a ton of stuff that people are, you know, no one in the right, well, you know, I'm not going to make that conclusion, but a lot of stuff is said that seems so outlandish that it could only be to, to poke and prod at somebody to get a response out of somebody. And I think if you can remove those moments, I don't know why you wouldn't try to achieve a more harmonious sort of commenting section. You know, one thing we didn't address, though, is so we've been talking about the New York Times, which I'm sure their comment section is, you know, equally as worth reading as their articles. But there are websites where the comments are for um, a different purpose, right? To laugh, to make fun, to have jokes. So... Do you think those websites could adopt moderators or would it kind of kill the commenting vibe? You have sites out there that are thriving on the engagement of their comment section, but it's arguably all entertainment. There's no, you have to sift through a hundred comments to find maybe two posts that are yeah. worth adding value to the conversation. A project like moderator definitely adds a lot of value, but it's also not, it's not meant to make any wide sweeping changes. It's really just there to facilitate what is currently happening behind the scenes. True. And it is a very, there's no, they don't really say like, hey, we're going to sell this to other people. It's really more of a New York Times driven project that I'm sure addresses their needs in a very specific way. Yeah. Let me, let me ask you, yeah. obviously on, on making, there are no comments. Yep. Do you think that that's the right or wrong thing to do? Ooh. So, we talked about this way back when, when I first saw the prototype of the site. And you you said to me, I don't know if you remember this. You were like, oh, we're going to add comments later. Uh, maybe you don't remember this. Or maybe I've misremembered this. But that, that's what I think it happened. You said to me, this is the prototype. We're going to add a comment section later. And I was like, oh, but why? Let's not add comments. Like, it looks great as it is. Like, we don't need a comment section. It'll just junk up the place. And I guess I was concerned about not that the make and traffic is anywhere near the New York Times level, but I was concerned about moderation and having to um, put out any fires that might happen. Though I guess maybe, I mean, it, what, was it, your, what was your reasoning? If you remember this story, what was your reasoning for not having comments in the prototype and then for originally wanting to put in a comment section? 
you automatically revert to the worst case scenario of the comment section essentially being this battleground of trolls, all this stuff. It did not occur to me to think, oh, maybe the comment section would be a really friendly, lovely yeah. place where people care for one another. Yeah. For, for us, in the very beginning stages, I think aesthetically in the art direction, not that it couldn't support it, but we just felt, you know, up in, until we get to a point in time where we have a sufficient viewership that is actually going to use the comment section, then I, we didn't feel as necessary. And that's sort of why the Slack community came into play. But I find the Slack community and just commenting in general part of the very fabric of the internet where there's a sense of democracy. If you have a voice, it should be exercised if you want to. Um, you shouldn't be limited by what you can say and what you can't say. Um, I think as I become a little bit more experienced or maybe it's just seeing how things have played out, the theory and the actual practical application are two different things. Yeah. And I, I, I want to have this romantic notion of, Hey, you know what? People are going to exercise their voice, but honestly, it, I don't think that it necessarily plays out as well as you want it to. There's just, it just, the lack of friction makes it even noisier. You know, a comment section makes it even noisier when everyone can say anything. Yeah. So it's kind of like, how do you build in special, special guardrails or special speed bumps so that people that actually have something to say? And I mean, you know, if you're going to, if, if you're, if you feel very passionate about something, then you're going to go through those, those procedures to be heard. Should we move on to the next one? Sure thing. So number three. So the next topic, brands must be patrons, not sponsors. So there's an op-ed in AdAge by Douglas Brundage, uh, VP of Strategy at Team Epiphany, which is an agency out in New York. I've had the good fortune of working with Douglas a few years ago. Um, he even came out to Hong Kong. Super smart guy, very on point, great writer. And I thought he brought, brought some interesting points the article itself was inspired by recent controversies in the States over brands that have pulled their sponsorship from creative programs. So the one most notable one in this case was Delta Airlines and the Bank of America, who pulled their support from the public theater. Uh, this was due to a modern day appropriation of Shakespeare's Julius Caesar, which was kind of modernized for 2017, and it featured a Trump-like figure, Donald Trump. So there was another situation right around the same time where JP Morgan pulled their support with NBC News because there was a Megyn Kelly interview with, with someone who had a conspiracy theory regarding the Sandy Hook shooting a few years ago, which was a shooting involving an elementary school. Um, so I think it kind of brought to light maybe this other topic where what is the purpose of sponsorship within editorial products and creative products? And I mean, Probably not the best word to use, like to call it a product, but I guess just sponsorship of these initiatives. Okay, so my question for you, specifically regarding the Julius Caesar public theater incident that you mentioned with uh, Bank of America and Delta. Who do you think should have done what in this situation to make it better? Or to have avoided this entire fiasco. The one thing that I, I, I think, and I really question, I, I don't know the full behind the scenes is in this partnership, how closely were they talking to one another? It seems if, if this, if you're a longtime sponsor, which, you know, these sponsors have, it's not like they've, they've just entered the picture recently. They've been longtime sponsors of the public theater. How could it, how could it get to a point where you had no idea this was going to happen? You know, I don't, I just wonder if in, in my perspective, if you're going to enter a partnership with someone, you should have the respect and transparency between one another. Um, even if you don't agree with it, I think to be notified ahead of time so that you can sort of make adjustments. Mm -hmm. You know, if, if this really is something that you feel doesn't fit with your brand, then I think it's better to say it behind closed doors and to work it out. Then, have, then wait for it to enter the public space. And then all of a sudden people are making very quick decisions on the fly based on public backlash. Yeah. And I mean, if, if the partner is not transparent to begin with, that brings into question how you value that partnership and that relationship. Mm. To that, to that point, I think the, the, the more important part of this is, and this is sort of what Douglas was alluding to in his piece. It's what is the actual value of brands coming in and supporting the arts? 
you know, and, and the arts in general should create a safe space, which is a trendy word I've, I've been using a lot lately, but create these safe spaces where people can go in and discuss things and not feel like they, they're limited in their voice. And if they have something they really want to touch upon, they feel has relevance to culture and society, they should be encouraged to do so. You know, bring those topics out to the forefront. Whether or not you feel this is incorrect or not, I think that's where the partnership lies. You know, you're supporting people that obviously you're, you're getting behind their, what they do and their initiative and their, their POV. But I think it's sort of like you can't have your cake and eat it too when they're actually exercising that voice. I, I agree. Okay. That the creatives need to be sharing with their brands, with their sponsors about what the content is going to be like. But I also feel as if they should get a little bit more license in this case. I mean, I know what you're saying. Like the ideal situation is that it's a partnership that they're working together. Like maybe Bank of America and Delta have reps that are, you know, highly involved with the public theater team. Like that's the ideal version. But if that's not what was happening, then I think if banks and airlines sign on for something like this, they have to be, they have to be willing to be a little bit more permissible. You know, like I don't think. I guess I feel like the public is not going to go see Julius Caesar and think, oh my God, like this guy is so much like Trump. I can't believe the Bank of America like sponsored this. You know, I'm never going to go to that bank again. I personally don't think that that reaction would have happened, but I think even if that, even if one person felt that way, the bank and the airline did not have to pull out because of that fear. You know, like I don't, I guess I wish they were willing to encourage less safe art. It's funny. We use safe in like two different ways. Cause you said like safe yeah. space and I want them to, I want them to have a safe space to do less safe art. I guess part of the problem in specifically in North America right now is that the whole place is, um, like a powder keg, you know? I was going to use tinderbox, but yeah. Same, powder same keg. metaphor, basically, where, exactly, where maybe, maybe it's not crazy that these corporate, um, sponsors are thinking anything could be the match. What sort of political stance do you think brands should have? Both of these controversies that arose were heavily focused on political narratives. You know, one being Trump, the other one being, sort of conspiracy theorists around gun control and Sandy Hook. I'm actually thinking back to around when Trump was first elected and he started this tech advisory board where he invited a bunch of industry leaders to join his board and to meet with him and to potentially, I guess, influence his decisions in terms of tech. In, in art industry, a lot of people were following this news because we wanted to know, Hey, is Tim Cook from Apple going to join? You know, is like, what is Peter Thiel's entire, what does he get out of supporting Trump? Right. Like, why is Peter Thiel being so closely involved? And then like Elon Musk agreed to be on the board who re- recently withdrew. Um, so a lot of people were like, these people we respect outside of political spheres. Like, what are their political stances? And I guess I feel like it's a really, I don't know. I'm not sure what I want to have happen. I just acknowledge that it's so complex, right? Cause on one hand, I don't want the brands I support. Oh, I'm just going to make all my political colors clear. I don't want the brands I support to support Trump, but if they can somehow influence him, then I guess like you have to play in the devil's den. Though my version of this means that brands can only be playing with him if they don't support him. And if a brand does support him, then I'm against it. So I I can't have it both ways, right? Like you can't have it both ways. (laughs) I want, I don't mind brands having political affiliations. Either way, any, any political affiliation. 
I mean, if it, it just comes down to, I'd rather someone stand for something than stand for nothing. Uh, rather just be just a, a just, you, you know, a vehicle towards commerce. That, that's how I see my interest in a brand, right? Though I do think about, like, how much does a brand consider their target audience, like their user base, their customers when they make some sort of political stance? I don't think they, I don't think they actually have any bearing over that. But given the opportunity, which for better or worse, it's trendy. Like, I don't, I don't expect a brand to go out and do it, but if they do do it, to stand behind it. Okay. Yeah. Should we move on to the last one? Yep. Let's do it. So our last piece of news we want to talk about is this new company called Tonal which was started by New York City-based Joshua Kissy and Seattle-based Karen Okwankwo. Uh, Tonal was conceived by these two friends as a way to modernize stock photography. They wanted to add diversity and authenticity in a part of the creative industry where they see a lack of these things. Um, the big yeah. players in stock photography, as many people know, are Shutterstock and Getty, and they they... They do the best they can. You know, they have huge databases. I have used both of them before, but they really don't seem to be trying to do anything innovative. I think that's a fair way to put it. You know, like they're not on several fronts, right? Like they don't really have a large range of models and they don't seem to hire like, um, photographers with more of a look. Like they're, the look that they have tends to be quite bland. Yeah. 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 It's so bland that people make fun of it. You've seen the one where it's like people eating salad happily, right? Like, I'm so happy eating this uh, salad. Mean, they be, it yeah. becomes memes. We, we were trolling each other yesterday over this. You know, Alex <laughs> and I need to take a photo together. And it was literally people just searching two Asian guys and all the, all the different stock photography options that came up, you know, with the, with the ugly watermarks. Yeah. Um, but it is like to, cheesing in front of the camera, wearing yeah. gray t-shirts. Yeah. But, um, in regards to the whole initiative, like I've known Joshua for a few years now. And one thing I've always respected from him was his ability to bring to light the difficulties and experiences that he's endured from, you know, a racial perspective. And he's always done it in a really tasteful way. The one thing that's always been very difficult for me, first off, I've never really felt a need for this product because I'm not, I just, I wouldn't, I don't really have a need for it, right? Like I'm not a designer. I don't need it for, um, any sort of things I, I do on a day to day, but I also, but also to that point, being in Asia where it's a little bit more monoculture to an extent, you know, it's predominantly Asian people here. Um, it's just not something that I, I actively think about as much, you know, I don't think about the need for it. But I do understand based on my, you know, based on just the, the common narrative of what's going on in the States, like obviously having more diversity, inclusion and options is something that everyone's put. Well, not everyone. There are a lot of people pushing for it. So it comes at a, at a, at a great time. And I, but one thing that, that struck me as, as being, uncertain was like the business model of it yeah because what is the right or wrong way to price this if it's too high is it price gouging in a way because like oh i'm the only one doing this so i can you know i can extract maximum revenue right but if it's too low then it risks sustainability issues so what what is the right medium here that's the one thing and i mean it's not really a right or wrong answer it's just if the goal should a company like tonal that is providing um, a more diverse sort of series of photos, do they have an underlying agenda of promoting diversity and by doing so, reducing the costs of their services? Man, is that a good question? That is a good question. And I'm thinking about it because for stock photography, designers usually need to have a mid to large size budget before they're even able to buy photos. And many Smaller clients will just request that the designer um, find free stock photos or even take their own stock photos, like take photos for the project because they don't like clients tend to not fully understand 
that to find the exactly right image, you might have to pay for that image. You know, like, there's so many free images on the internet. Why can't you just grab one of them? And now we're talking about, like, copyright issues, right? So it will be interesting how Tonal prices and advertises because I feel like they they can do this thing where they not only promote diversity in stock photos, but also promote actually using good stock photos instead of like ripping things from the internet or settling for taking something on your iPhone. But there's definitely a need for it, as you've recognized. Yeah, yeah. No, definitely a need. I think there's a need if you talk to any designer the designer would recognize and talk about. Um, and I think, I think the hard part is like convincing people to pay for it or like convincing designers to advocate to their clients to pay for it. My, my topic about, about pricing is inconsequential in the grand scheme of things, because if there's a need for this product, then that need will find a product market fit right that's true so it doesn't really matter i was just thought it was interesting because there's a certain there's a certain underlying narrative and story behind this where it's about you know in some ways bringing diversity and inclusion to the mix but yeah. it's like what is what is the purpose of the of tonal i mean we would just need to ask them you know actually to see, to- what, to see what their perspective to throw us in here, um, Tonal is also developing Tonal narratives. So they're going to write about the subjects in their photos, and they're also going to start a podcast. Uh, yeah, that sounds. That all sounds awesome because I think that there's definitely more than enough room for those topics to be introduced. I think that's a good place to cut it off today. If you're interested in hearing more about Macon and its membership opportunities, head over to Macon.com. There you'll experience some of our stories focused on the sights and sounds of creative culture. You can also subscribe to us through your favorite podcast app or platform. I'm Eugene. I'm Sharice. And this is Making It Up.